Welcome to Capitol View, our look inside and outside the Illinois State Capitol and all the happenings in between. I'm Jennifer Fuller. Our guests this week are Amanda Vinicky of WTTW and Chicago Tonight and Charlie Wheeler, the Emeritus Director of the Public Affairs Reporting Program at the University of Illinois Springfield. Both of you, thanks so much. Glad to be here. You're welcome. Good to be here. We had a whole list of topics to talk about today, and before we even got started, that list had to be thrown out the window and we're starting from scratch. Big news in terms of Illinois politics this week, both behind the scenes and right at the front, with the Illinois primary less than a week away now. We're hearing that billionaire donor Ken Griffin is saying, you know, I think I'm done with Illinois. He's moving his company, reportedly, to Miami. Amanda, what does this mean? just days before the primary, and this is a big player in Illinois politics. He is a big player in Illinois politics because, you know, money talks. In fact, the U.S. Supreme Court has told us so. And Griffin's money has really been, especially since Rauner left Illinois, also for Florida. Uh, we're talking about previous Governor uh, Bruce Rauner, that is. He'd been come in as a key funder of the Illinois Republican Party, sort of resurrected it, had a GOP in statewide office. And then since he left, Griffin came in. Um, also got Dick Uline, another very wealthy Illinoisan, to, to come back and try to resurrect again the Illinois Republican Party. But as we saw the GOP divided between really the conservatives and then the more old school establishment, however you want to think of it, Republicans. And according to new polling that we have, it really shows even more that the establishment candidate who Griffin had backed, Richard Irvin, really behind in the polls. And so Griffin says that he's out. He's been indicating this, kind of hinted at it, that he was so upset with crime in Chicago that that was going to make him take Citadel and his family and leave. But I, I think it's more than that. It is crime. It is also, I think, sort of um, you, you, it, both the timing of this move, this announcement, and what we have gleaned in terms of one of the reasons perhaps that Irvin is sinking, we're, we're not, he's not getting any additional infusion of cash. It's apparent from Griffin that he, he's done with Illinois politics. Richard Irvin was just one of the Republican candidates backed by Ken Griffin. There was a whole slate of what they called Griffin candidates. Charlie, what does this mean for those campaigns? Is there, uh, you know, a more ominous sign than your biggest financial backer pulling out of the entire state right before the election? Well, if, if I'm not mistaken, the amount of money that was um, given by Griffin to the other people on the so-called Irvin Slate was pretty minuscule. A lot of the money was funneled through Irvin's campaign itself. And I'm guessing that most of the, of the people on the slate probably will succeed. I'm trying to, this is horrible. I'm trying to remember who the heck they are. So you've got you know, uh, Steve Kim for Attorney General, Tom Demmer for Treasurer, John Milheiser for Secretary of State. Okay, um, yeah. And then uh, Sharon, forgetting her Teresa. name. Yes, there we go, for Comptroller. So I, I do well, think it does not those, bode well for them the, in terms well, of if you were expecting of them, any Griffin cash. A couple of them don't have primary oppositions. Demmer is, is going to get nominated, for example. Uh, Milheiser, and this is something that, puzzled me from the beginning. Bill Hayes is a former judge, former U.S. attorney. He's running for secretary of state. You figure a guy like that, why doesn't he run for attorney general? That would fit in my mind more with what his qualifications are, rather than being the guy who gives out driver's licenses and, and lectures people about drunk driving, but whatever. And he's facing Dan Brady from Bloomington, who has been in the legislature, I think, for almost a decade. And who more. in more? Yeah, mm -hmm. and in the in the current state of Republican affairs, he would be seen as being more moderate compared to a lot of his compatriots, particularly from that part of the state. So I I think some of Griffin's people will survive. Irvin is going down the tubes big time. And of course, with him goes his running mate, Avery Bourne, a state lawmaker from Springfield, the Springfield area. She lives, I believe, in Morrisonville. And in my mind, that's kind of sad because she was very young, very bright, very articulate. And when she first came to the legislature, I looked at her as someone who, if they stuck with it, 
would have an opportunity to rise up in the ranks and someday maybe be the House Republican leader. And now, from all indications, she's going to be a, a, a used to was or a has been after next Tuesday. I do think, Charlie, that while some of the um, members of the slate will certainly get out of the primary, either because they'll win, although that is no guarantee in the Secretary of State and Attorney General contests where there is some true competition, um, they, they're going to, it's going to be perhaps tougher in a primary election where if you do have um, Darren Bailey succeeding, there is Really, it seems no love lost in, internally. They're, they're not going to be you know, running together. And who had been the primary backer is exiting the state. The Republicans um, are, are, I think, going to be hard up to get cash to truly compete, particularly when you've got Democrats backed by Pritzker's billion. Yeah, but, but I would argue in November, where the Republican Party is currently nationally, and the folks are the loudest voices in Illinois, they're kind of out of sync with what the majority of the Illinois voters are. So whether Griffin is here to throw millions at him or not, I'm pretty sure the whole Republican ticket is going down the tubes come November, barring some dramatic unforeseen circumstance. Well, Charlie, you bring up an interesting point, and we've been kind of dancing around this question throughout the primary as you look at the challenge between Darren Bailey, who has uh, the highly conservative backing. He's hoping for an endorsement this weekend, as a matter of fact, from former President Donald Trump versus the Richard Irvin, as Amanda, as you call them, the more established Republican Party, perhaps a bit more moderate. Uh, is this a sea change when it comes to the Republican Party of Illinois? I mean, we heard just earlier this spring from uh, the Senate Republican leader, Dan McConkie, who said that Illinois' Republican Party is not the party of Trump. It appears by polling that perhaps that's not exactly accurate. Well, it occurs to me, maybe more relevantly, and this, of course, is going to date me, it's not the Republican Party of the of the governors that I covered as a reporter for the Sun-Times, starting with Richard Ogilvie through Jim Thompson, through Jim Edgar, uh, even George Ryan. Uh, it's taken a huge shift to the right. And part of it appeals to the, oh, for one of the, if you will, the, the pejorative uh, description of the angry old white guys uh, like me, although I don't think I'm particularly angry. Um, whereas the demographics of the state are moving in a different direction. And so the, the, the current forces in the Republican Party are not the same as the people who ran it back in the day when it had success. And there are people who, in my judgment, would be more in tune with maybe Southern Indiana or Iowa rather than the, the state of Illinois, which is dominated by the metropolitan area of Chicago, obviously, which is a lot more, I believe it's a lot younger, it's a more diverse, more progressive, more liberal than downstate Illinois. We're seeing this play out as well, as we mentioned that uh... Uh, Senator Darren Bailey, who is the front runner now for the GOP nomination for governor, is hoping for an endorsement from former President Trump. Trump is going to be in central Illinois in Quincy over the weekend with uh, Congresswoman Mary Miller, who has already received his endorsement. She's in that hotly contested race against Representative Rodney Davis, running in the same district because, as we've explained before, Illinois is losing a congressional seat. How is this going to play out in your mind? Is it too late for Darren Bailey to get that endorsement? Does he need it? Amanda? I'm not sure that he does need it, at least if polling is correct. I mean, I, I sort of have been wondering as we've been reporting on these polls, polls were late in coming. We didn't have a lot of them early on. Um, how how much of uh, this is, I, I think part of it, that there's a lot that goes into Darren Bailey's rise. Uh, I think the leak of the abortion decision is a big player there. I think, frankly, a flawed campaign strategy on the part of Irvin uh, is a large part of it, changing demographics, but also 
you know, it's sort of a is self-fulfilling. You, you report he's the front runner and then there's more backing and you report Irvin is sinking and then that feeds into it. And so how much of this, is, frankly, the media cycle um, contributes to. At this point, if those are to be believed and we definitely get the pulse that, that they are pretty spot on, um, it, that I don't think he needs it. You already have Darren Bailey getting boosts from the Democratic Party of Illinois and, and the governor saying he's too conservative for Illinois, which is something that Bailey wants out there in terms of the party. Bailey is clearly doing all he can. He is uh, not running away from his conservative bona fides. And that is one that Pritzker is pushing in the hopes that that is going to put it over the top and make for what some had expected would have been a perhaps tough race for Pritzker after COVID with a lot of people not perhaps thrilled. Other people, of course, fully behind all that Pritzker has done, um, that, that, that that's not going to be an issue. So in terms of Trump, Bailey doesn't need it. Does he want it? Sure. That wouldn't hurt. That'd be great. But he already has pictures with the former president that he's running in his campaign ads. Will President Trump do it? I mean, I have no inner, uh, include the inner psyche of, of Trump by any means, but he certainly hasn't thus far. So I'm not sure what would make him wait until Saturday when he has already gotten behind Mary Miller, other than, yeah, maybe he'll be on stage, have a good chat with Bailey, speak extemporaneously, and, and, and Bailey will get some sort of nod. But I don't imagine at this point in time that's going to change the dynamic in any way. No, and, really? and I think given uh, the former president's kind of approach to these things, the fact that Darren Bailey is looking more and more like a sure winner makes it much more likely that Donald Trump will endorse him on Saturday. Yeah, a notch in victory in his him. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You've both mentioned this recent polling that's showing Darren Bailey out even further in front of the rest of the, the pack when it comes to the Republicans. But new numbers show uh, that Jesse Sullivan has now moved ahead, at least within the margin of error, of Richard Irvin. Uh, Charlie, is there any opportunity here, you think, for an Election Day surprise where suddenly you see someone like Jesse Sullivan come out on top? Um, I'll never say never because you never know what is going to happen. But I would be absolutely astonished if Jesse Sullivan were the Republican nominee. Uh, he's got a lot of baggage, too. He's, he's portrayed as being an outsider. He was born in Petersburg, but he comes from Silicon Valley. He's, he's one of those tech guys that a lot of the Republican base is suspicious of. He's portraying himself as probably the most theocratic of the group, and I'm not sure how that how well that would would go over. And I think I think it it's more likely than not that he he'll be back in the pack. He may come in second, or he may come in third, but wherever he comes in, he's going to be pretty far behind Bailey. Amanda, let's push this out beyond the Illinois primary, which is June 28th, Tuesday. What does the messaging convert itself to. A lot of times you see candidates race to the extremes for a primary and then they've got to come back to the middle to win over those more moderate voters in November. Will that happen here? You know, I would have thought so at one point in time, uh, particularly if it is Irvin who captures the nomination. He has been very careful about what he said. That was the strategy. It could appear to be a flawed one, but it certainly was one that was looking ahead to getting out of the primary with an eye to November. Uh, Bailey, not so much. I mean, he has, uh, you, you did see, I think, part of the campaign, maybe a change in tenor, for example, in Chicago, where there's a lot of population, aka a lot of voters, Bailey campaigning in the city and saying, I like visiting here. My wife, Cindy and I, it's great. And then during debates, he doubled down on calling Chicago a hellhole. That is something that may well resonate with residents um, of Southern Illinois who feel very fractured from the city, but that's probably not gonna go over so great in the, the city, maybe even in the suburbs, despite folks who are dissatisfied by what is happening in the city proper may not take too kindly to it. So I don't know how you walk away from that. There's going to, he, he might, but he has tried to say, I'm a conservative, and I think that that's a message that can win. Um, Pritzker, 
again, perhaps may retool. He's, I think, always very careful. And of course, there's talk of Pritzker trying to be President Pritzker. So he's going to be calibrating his message, particularly, I think he'll be feeling fairly confident if Bailey captures the GOP nomination. He may need to recalibrate if polls show that that general election race will be anything like close, but he's kind of, I think, already expecting, all right, got it in the bag, let's look to the White House. Sure, there's already been a visit, in fact, to New Hampshire that Governor Pritzker made in the last several days. Is that going to hurt him as he tries to work with the legislature in the in the coming years? If he were to win re-election in November, Charlie, do you see lawmakers saying, uh, there's another person who's already checked out, we're going to do what we want to do, and therefore any agenda that he might have would be dead on arrival? No, I don't think so. And the reason I say that is because his agenda is not likely to vary that greatly from what the majority of the Democrats in the General Assembly want. It's not like a situation where you had Pat Quinn, who had a lot of bad feelings with House Speaker Magan going back a long, long ways, where the legislature, despite the Democratic control of both chambers, basically ignored Pat Quinn. It wasn't like with Rod Blagojevich, where it became pretty clear that he was a, a crook early on, so the legislature didn't really want to deal with him. And Pritzker has had good success with the General Assembly so far. There have been issues where there have been differences of opinion. His people have been able to negotiate with the involved lawmakers and come up with compromises to move the state forward. And I would, I would say they're pretty much on the same page. And if someone is intent on running for president, one of the things you want to do is make sure that people can't point and say, you want to run the country and you can't even run your own state? What the heck? And so he's, if that's indeed his intention, I think that would be more incentive for him to work with legislative leaders to move forward a, a program. And a lot of that will depend. I, I wholly agree with Charlie. I think a lot of this is going to depend. This year was somewhat easy to do, actually, because Illinois had a whole bunch of cash. A lot of this is going to be dependent and kind of Pritzker's future path. The path of our state, all of our finances collectively are going to depend a lot on what happens with the economy if there is a recession, what that would mean for a bottom line in states and will it make it tougher for particularly those like Illinois that while our budget was in a great place this year still have some long term uh, fiscal issues to reckon with um, what choices will be ahead. One of the national issues that either person, any person that uh, wins election for governor in November will have to grapple with is gun legislation, crime, things that are going to continue to be newsmakers long after anybody is uh, casting a ballot. The U.S. Supreme Court is out this week with a new decision that may impact Illinois when it comes to concealed carry legislation to uh, the Illinois Supreme Court, for example, uh, ruling or choosing not to rule on concealed carry uh, and, and uh, other FOID card issues. Sorry, I forgot the uh, term that I was looking for, FOID card issues. How is this going to impact what gets done between now and November when you've got these big national and statewide issues that perhaps need to be addressed, perhaps even through a, a special session of the General Assembly? Amanda? So the special session that we're hearing talk about would really be geared toward another, hasn't been issued yet, but U.S. Supreme Court opinion we know will be issued sooner than later dealing with abortion. And Illinois already has, is mostly in place for if Roe v. Wade were to essentially uh, be overturned in this opinion, that if, uh, the right to an abortion would be nonetheless enshrined in Illinois law. Um, what the special session would be over would be, for example, to give protection to healthcare workers. When we turn, however, to the gun decision from the U.S. Supreme Court issued on Thursday, uh, you know, right now this is dealing with a law in New York that didn't allow gun owners to freely carry a gun in public. They had to sort of prove that they had some sort of necessity to do so. Illinois isn't one of the handful of states that has anything like that. If you have a concealed carry permit and you go through all the requisite public safety checks, you do have the ability to carry a gun in public where that is allowed. So um, 
I could have seen there being some sort of agenda, particularly in the wake of some of these mass shootings uh, for Illinois to try to push forward maybe tighter gun control legislation, but really there hasn't been an appetite for that in the General Assembly. It's tough to get those things through, tough even in Illinois with those Democratic supermajorities and Democrats holding statewide office and Democrats controlling the Illinois Supreme Court because this isn't strictly partisan to get something like uh, background checks or to get um, fingerprinting required for everybody applying for a gun license. So it does, I think, change the dynamic. What we could perhaps see, there's an expectation that this U.S. Supreme Court decision on guns could lead to a flood of new lawsuits further seeking to take down what restrictions Illinois has in place at present. Charlie, that case before the Illinois Supreme Court challenged whether or not Illinois' firearm owner's ID card system was constitutional or whether it violated uh, the Constitution in terms of a Second Amendment right or other gun rights that are enshrined. Do you see that case going anywhere or would there have to be a change in the makeup of the Illinois Supreme Court before that would change? Well, I think the, the ruling that came down the other day was in keeping with the long history of Illinois courts that they don't want to get into the constitutionality of anything if they can find a way to avoid it. And so the ruling was on a procedural one that there were errors made at a lower level. And when the, the trial court attempted to change the underlying case beyond what the Supreme Court said should be involved, then the Supreme Court said no and you've got to go through the regular appeal process. And the dissenters said, well, that's, you're going to wind up at the same place. Why can't you settle it right now without getting into all the details? Because it's a pretty complicated case. But it struck me as at some point, we're going to get a case before the Supreme Court, Illinois Supreme Court, dealing with the legitimacy of whether or not you need to have a FOIA card. One of the arguments made against it, which has been mitigated through action taken by the legislature in Pritzker, there was a heck of a long waiting period. You'd apply to get your card and you could wait like a year. Now it's turned around pretty much within the time frame set within the in in the uh, in the statute. So I think it would be upheld by the Illinois Supreme Court, given its current makeup. It could well be challenged and go to the ultimately in federal court go to the US Supreme Court and say, well, this is another requirement upon my ability to have whatever kind of weapon I want. I shouldn't have to go through this rigmarole and get a license and all that. Um, so we'll have to see. Although I, I saw a news story, uh, NPR news story, mentioning that Justice Kavanaugh, in his concurring opinion, wrote that this does not affect any licensing requirements in most of the states, it's just this handful of states, as, as Amanda uh, mentioned, where you had to have a special reason. And so I, I would guess, at least as, as my brief understanding of it is, Illinois doesn't say you have to have a special reason to have it, it just says you gotta fill out the paperwork. So I think that may pass muster, at least for the moment. Sure, sure. All of these things constantly evolving, and it's certainly something we'll keep an eye on. In a short amount of time that we have remaining, we saw yet another conviction and sentence uh, this week in Illinois politics. Former state Senator Tom Cullerton sentenced to a year in federal prison for embezzlement. Amanda, what's it going to take to change the culture of politics in Illinois from where people say, oh yeah, sure, there's another conviction, there's another sentence? Jen, that's either a two-second answer of I don't know, or perhaps a book, a thesis to investigate what it will possibly take. There certainly are laws on the books. What had been illegal remains illegal. Uh, I'm still wondering, there was a Senator A mentioned in some of the uh, federal court filings there. Still curious about who that is that is helped to sort of arrange a deal along these lines for Senator Cullerton. But um, he is one of, I believe it was seven within really the past you know, few years really of sitting legislators who's dealing with a corruption oriented battle at the courthouse. It really is dismaying for all of Illinois politics and those concerned about government. Certainly. Charlie, 
Last word on corruption and politics in Illinois. Is there a bright future or do we see more of the same? Um, I would argue that the only way that it will be a bright future is if we, the electorate, demand it. And if we, the, the electorate, uh, upgrade our own performance. Be informed and be active in terms of voting. Those are all great words and great advice as we head toward the Illinois primary. Charlie, Amanda, thanks so much. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on Capitol View. I'm Jennifer Fuller. Join us next time right here on your public media station.